Okay, trivia time. All right, got the thinking cap on. What are the five most watched final episodes of television shows? The top five final episodes of television shows. Dallas. Who? Dallas. Dallas was not one of them. Oh, you know, who shot JR was, was one of the largest, but not, not the finale. Mash. Mash, number one. Yeah. Yes. What else? Cheers. Cheers. Did somebody say cheers? Yes, cheers. Number two. Friends. Friends. That's number four. <laughs> Seinfeld. Seinfeld, number three. What's number five? You gotta go back a number of years for this one. Yeah. All, all of the family. The Magnum PI. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he'll laugh at that one too. I don't know. I never saw it. But I better remember. Was that um, who was that? Tom, Tom Selleck. Yeah. Okay. Big mustache. <laughs> but you know, a lot of television shows do come to an end, and it's for various reasons. You know, the screenwriters get tired of writing about it, or the viewership falls off, or perhaps the actors just want to go do something different. And when they do come to an end, we viewers tend to be sad. And I can remember for the final episode of MASH, several pastors and our spouses got together at one of their houses to watch this final episode. And we enjoyed watching it together. And I noticed that when we were driving home, the streets were empty because everybody else wanted to watch that final episode. And when, when we have enjoyed something and it comes to an end, it does kind of leave a sense of emptiness in us, though a vacancy and perhaps a sadness that wants to be filled. And fortunately, when it comes to a favorite television show coming to an end, we do have a way to ease that sadness and emptiness. And the miracle cure, through, it comes through that wonderful medication called reruns. <laughs> All of our favorite shows we can find almost anywhere, anytime on those very distant channels. When these reruns are watched, it kind of brings back that feeling of nostalgia, that things were really okay. And we just kind of go, ah, I like that one. Okay, here's another trivia question, and you younger folks may not have a clue what I'm talking about. What GE-sponsored television show did Ronald Reagan host before he became president? Who? That show of shows. No. Nope. Took place in a dry oh. de desert place. Death Valley Days. Death Valley Days. <laughs> there you go. Death Valley Days. It was all about that hot stretch of land, uh, that, uh, about stories that, uh, that people had to face the challenges and struggles of going through that place. and. It definitely apparently lived up to its name. Well, this morning, we read about another kind of a dry place, another death valley of sorts, and we call it the Valley of Dry Bones. And here's what was going on. A lot of the Hebrews, uh, were, which were God's often wayward people, had been in exile to Babylon, well, what is now known as modern-day Iraq, and around 586 B.C. A lot of the people were, were taken away, they were missing, friends, family members were killed or wounded or missing. And the people kept asking the question, how long, O oh Lord, have you abandoned us? What would, are we going to cease to exist as a people? And we're so far from home, we just don't have that, that place of, to put our anchors down. How can we survive in this strange land? And as the people languished, not knowing their future, and having no reruns to comfort them, the Lord took Ezekiel and set him down in this valley full of dry bones. As Ezekiel said, the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of <coughs> bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley. 
and they were very dry. Now, I'm not sure why he emphasized very dry, unless he really wanted people to know that they were dry bones. It was as though a vast army had been decimated, their armor and clothing stripped and their bodies left unburied for scavengers and wild animals to, to clean and scatter and for the winds to scour and for the sun to bleach and to dry out. And when God asked Ezekiel if those bones could live, Ezekiel said essentially, how should I know? Only you could do such a thing. And to answer the question is impossible even for us, even with our marvels of modern science these days. Only God knows the answer to such questions. And then God told Ezekiel to prophesy, to speak on his behalf to the bone. Well, God said that he would then send his ruach, his breath or spirit, to enter those bones so that they would live. And the Hebrew word for ruach appears 10 times in verses 1 through 14. And this word can mean wind, it can mean spirit or breath or air, depending on the context. And all four of those interpretations are used in this chapter. So Ezekiel prophesied to the bones and there was a rumbling. So the bones that were separated from all over the place started to come together, properly linking bone to its bone, along with uh, correctly attaching muscles and tissue and skin. But the Bible says even though that happened, the bodies were still lifeless. There was no breath in them. Well, in the second step, God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath, or the wind, and that the cadavers might come back to life. And as Ezekiel prophesied, and the breath came into them, they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Well, in this vision, the dry bones are identified with the whole house of Israel. They are the dispirited people God talked about. The Lord said that he would put his breath in his people again, and they would live, and they would know that he was their Lord. God said, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. Now during that time period, the Hebrew people were convinced that the life they had known and the life that they had been promised were over, never to return. But what God showed Ezekiel and subsequently what Ezekiel said to the people was God had not abandoned them. They were going to be restored they would once again be filled with life, and God would fill them with his spirit. Once again, God proved who he was and is, a God of life. Well, similarly, in our reading from John, our Lord raised Lazarus from the dead so that he could display more of God's power. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were very good friends of Jesus, and a messenger was sent by Martha to let Jesus know that his good friend Lazarus was ill and wanted Jesus to come right away to heal him. Well, Jesus received that message and wasn't really concerned with the news, and he didn't immediately go to Lazarus. The Bible says that he stayed where he was for another two days. And then he wanted to go on to Judea, but his disciples convinced him not to. At one point, Somehow Jesus knew that Lazarus had died. He said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. And the disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. But Jesus had used the euphemism of falling asleep to mean that Lazarus had died. And the disciples figured that Lazarus was just fighting a fever and fell asleep as the body tried to heal itself. And this would have been typical. But Jesus was talking about the death of his friend. And since the disciples missed the message, Jesus came flat out and said, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. But let's go to it. And when Jesus arrived where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, 
Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And many of the Jews who had gone to Martha and Mary to provide comfort were there as well. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him and met him while Mary stayed home. And Martha was not pleased with Jesus. As you may recall about the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha is rushing around doing all these things and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, Martha was a person of action. When something needed to be done, she wanted it done right then and there. Now, because Jesus had delayed his arrival, she was ticked at Jesus. And she said to him, Lord, if you had been here, if you had come when I called you, my brother would still be alive. But now he's dead. She lashed out at him for not coming immediately. And since he hadn't come right away, they were going through all kinds of grief, which she felt should not have happened. Well, death was very evident. The end had come. No more good times, no more conversations, no reruns. But Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha said that she knew he would in the last, last day. But that's not what Jesus meant. He meant he was going to bring her back, bring him back to life right then and right there. He was going to show them once and for all that he had power over death himself. And sure enough, braving the stench of death, calling to God to open the eyes of the people, Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. And out he came. And the people were astonished. And as the Bible said, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. You know, so often what seems to us to be a dead end actually isn't. It's actually a new beginning. Many experience something or encounter someone in a situation that looks like it will never come to life, like a marriage for which there seems to be no hope. Or perhaps there's a child or grandchild that seems to have lost his or her way, getting into all kinds of trouble or getting addicted to harmful substances. Perhaps a valued relationship seems dead. Or someone who seems spiritually dead is beyond reaching. You may have something lying there dead in your valley of bones or sealed in the tomb beside Lazarus. If you do, please know this. God can revive whatever seems like it's gone forever. He did it in Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones. He did it with Lazarus. He did it with his only son. And when we ask for a miracle to happen, we have a part to play as well. We just can't simply sit back and say, oh God, please go ahead and fix this for me. God expects us to do our part alongside him. Ezekiel saw a valley of dry bones. God could have brought them to life all by himself, but he had a part for Ezekiel to play. Ezekiel had to prophesy to the bones. He had to preach. He had to declare the word of the Lord. And as he did his part, God brought life to those dry bones. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, he had a part for the people to play as well. He could have moved the stone away himself. He could have gone into the tomb and brought Lazarus out all by himself. But Jesus knew the people needed to do their part. He had them move the stone away from the entrance. He called out to Lazarus to walk out of the tomb. And he had people unbind Lazarus from the burial cloths wrapped around him. We all have a part to play as well. When we reach what seems to be a dead end, we certainly pray to God. We may ask God to bring to an end whatever it is, or bring healing, or make something good happen. And God says, okay, I can do that. 
but you have to do your part as we work on the solution. What are we going to do together? So make yourself available to God to do whatever he directs, to play whatever part he wants you to play in helping bring life to what may seem like a dead end. The God who made a living multitude of people out of a valley of dry bones has the power to bring life where there has been such dryness. And Jesus does the same with us when we feel helpless. Remember, we don't usually hit dead ends. Instead, we encounter opportunities for renewed vision, opportunity, and life. And we need to open ourselves to our Lord's presence and guidance. And we need to get that elbow grease out and smear it on real well as we do our part. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word given to us. Grant us the wisdom and insight to write your word upon our hearts and the courage to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next